But there's a whole slew of other ways that we generate electricity, um, and this is a pretty good place to start. So in the case of nuclear, oh man, if you want to get into this, you should take Earth's natural resources. We've got a week all about kind of nuclear and how it works. Um, but to skip you the gory details, we actually take uranium. We take uranium, in particular an isotope of uranium called uranium-235. Naturally, naturally uranium-235 comprises about 7% of naturally occurring uranium. And we use various methods, particularly something called a gas centrifuge, to concentrate uranium-235. And once we're at about... Once we have about four to 5% uranium-235, we can take that, mix it with um, ceramic. Or basic. We take this ceramic and basically make something that kind of looks like a Pez candy. It kind of works like one, but that's a fuel pellet. And it's about four to 5% uranium, or uranium-235 in particular, and we stack those all together. Um, Naturally, uranium-235 has a half-life of like 700 million years because there's not very much of it. Once we start to concentrate it, every decay reaction will generally produce neutrons that run into other atoms and cause those to decay. Well, we're kind of getting deep in the weeds here, but the last thing that I wanted to add is that typically when those little decay reactions occur, the neutrons are moving too fast. They'll just blast through any other atoms, essentially unnoticed. So we need to figure out a way to slow them down um, by adding something that we call a moderator. And generally, a really easy one is actually water. Once you immerse that fuel cell in water, now those neutrons have enough stuff in the way that's providing friction that slows them down that when they hit another atom, they're going slow enough to cause that atom to swell and to further break down. And when that breaks down, it produces heat and some other like pretty terrible stuff, right? Some other um, like highly radioactive material, um, cesium and um, plutonium and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but it happens in pretty small volumes, which is one of the benefits. Um, the big picture with nuclear is actually very similar to what we've seen before. So I just wanted to talk you through the kind of radioactive decay here. So uranium-235 plus a neutron actually makes uranium-236 just for a minute. It's super unstable and it breaks apart to form a variety, all actually all sorts of different um, kind of uh, decay products. Again, cesium, plutonium, um, there's a whole list of them. I don't know them off the top of my head. And then actually three neutrons, those three neutrons continue on to smash into other uranium-235 atoms. So it actually provides this kind of like exponential um, reaction and energy is produced. So we can figure out how to control this reaction and we can take that energy and surprise, we're gonna boil water with it and that's what we do. We use that water to spin a pinwheel connected to a magnet, spin the magnet, create electricity. So on paper, nuclear is beautiful. Um, this is part of the problem with nuclear. And another problem with nuclear is generally it's super expensive to build, right? It might take, you know, five or 10 years to build a nuclear power plant. Um, also, it's got probably the biggest NIMBY factor, which is the knot in my backyard. Um, you know, I've pulled my students in a different class. 100% of them say nuclear is an important solution to our future energy um, problems. 75% of them said they would not support it in their state. That's NIMBY. NIMBY stands for not in my backyard. Like, good idea for Iowa, not here in Idaho. Um, anyway. So, again, nuclear's got a few things going for it. Um, the, some of the things that it has going against it, three things that it has going against it are Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Three Mile Island, right? Those are the three largest nuclear disasters. 
Um, those are, are, are a problem, particularly for large installations. Um, and each of those examples is really, really, really old technology, right? So the beginnings of the Fukushima um, plant that was in Japan and I think that was 2011, I believe. That was essentially 1960s technology, right? And think about what your, six, your cell phone looked like in 1960. It didn't, right? Or it was the size of a house. Um, so modern nuclear is really avoids a lot of the problems that are kind of ingrained in everyone's um, kind of psyche about nuclear and part of that nimbyism. Um, another interesting thing that, that we can do with nuclear, uh, another thing that we can do with nuclear is actually get away from these big expensive nuclear installations we call stick built, built on site with a construction crew and everything like that. That's expensive. Um, one of the kind of revolutions that people are starting to see in, in nuclear is actually what we call SMR, or Small Modular Reactor. So if everybody had to build their own car or um, you know, build their own house, that would be ridiculous. Actually, a car is a better example. Um, we have cars made out of factory. They have all the tools for making cars and all the experts in car, right? Those live at the car factory and they produce great cars that we drive around. Electric vehicles, that's new. Um, well, not new, but that's becoming more and more popular. Conventional or what they now call legacy vehicles, right? Traditional fuel. Um, so we're, that's what we're seeing here is actually companies that make a contained small reactor that might be, you know, 50 to 300 megawatts, right? Compared to, you know, 10,000 megawatts, or right? smaller, um, smaller amounts of electricity produced, but made in a factory that just makes them all day, right? Um, so the amount of fuel that they burn is fairly small because they're much smaller reactors. Um, they can be transported. Um, you know, some of them are you know the size of a truck, or or maybe the size of a semi truck. They can be carried on the back of a semi truck. Um, so they're made in a factory that can produce them for fairly cheap, rather than these kind of specialty stick built reactors that we have now. Um, so there's probably off the top of my head, I'm going to say 30 to 35 companies working on these right now. There's one in there's one being used. It's prototype, but it's in in function in Russia right now. It's 2022, a, and um, Rolls Royce is manufacturing these in England. So again, this could be a revolution. So if you're looking for something to invest in in your stock market uh, portfolio, think um, SMR, small modular reactors. None of these companies have really hit the market yet, but I think that this is likely a big solution um, because this whole process that we've outlined isn't producing CO2. It's producing some other stuff that could be fairly questionable, but it produces it in fairly small volumes and it's not in the atmosphere. It's a point source problem, right? It's like, here's a pile of radioactive waste. Yes, that is a problem if you're close to it. Um, and there's ways that we can contain that. Um, most countries, not all countries, but most countries see this as actually a resource that we will likely be going back and recovering, you know, in you know the next 10 or 15 years. You know, a, a kind of light water reactor, kind of standard one that Homer Simpson works at, that runs about 4% efficiency, but it's a very small percentage of that material. Um, in the modern world, we're really thinking about things different, um, not even using uranium, using thorium. Okay, so enough about nuclear and small modular reactors, although hopefully you all made like a, um, a back to the future joke, right? Like the little reactor. Or heck, you could even think about the engine in a submarine, a nuclear submarine. This is a little nuclear reactor. Um, but anyways, let's go and talk about some other ways to spin the magnet.